Good morning, everyone. I would like to call this House Veteran Affairs Emergency Preparedness Committee public hearing. Um, Call to order, okay? At this at this time, I would like to ask General Weller to please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oops. Yeah, we lost your folder there. Yeah, I got it. All right. Why don't we um, first take a couple seconds to go around and introduce the members and the staff that is here today with the um, with both committees. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. My name is Jonathan Fritz, representing the 111th district, comprising Wayne and Susquehanna counties. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Representative Dom Costa, 21st district, Allegheny County City. Good morning, everyone. Rick Saccone, representing the 39th District, which, is, which uh, represents Southern Allegheny County and Northern Washington Counties. Good morning, Barry Joswiak, 5th District, Berks County. Mark Gillen, Southern Berks, Northern Lancaster County. Brian Barbin, Cambria County. I represent Johnstown. I'm Michael Hillman. I am Democratic Executive Director, House Veterans Affairs. Uh, Representative Chris Sonaut, I'm the Democratic Chairman of the House Veteran Affairs Emergency Preparedness Committee. Sean Harris, Research Analyst for the Committee on Veterans Affairs. Good morning. I'm Rick O'Leary, Executive Director for Chairman Burrell. That's it. We're going to skip over you. Okay. <laughs> Aaron Robb, Republican Executive Director of the House Aging Committee. Pam Delisio, I represent the 194th, which are parts of Philadelphia and Montgomery counties. Steve McCarter, uh, Montgomery County, House District 154. Carol Hill Evans, representing the 95th District in York County. Martina White, representing Northeast Philadelphia, the 170th District. Frank Ryan, representing the 101st District in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. Chris Dush, uh, the 66th District in Jefferson and Indiana counties. Thank you. Um. I want to thank the staff for sending me the uh, memo in the uniform of the day. I forgot my jacket and tie, so um, I apologize for being so casual. Um, good morning. I'm, I'm Representative Steve Barrar, Majority Chair of the House Veteran Affairs and Emergency Preparedness Committee. I want to welcome everyone to our joint public hearing with the House Aging and Older D Adult Service Committee on the subject of assisting our aging veteran population. We have several expert panels before us today, and I want to thank them for being here. As well, I would like to thank DMVA Commandant Blackwood for hosting us at this beautiful state veterans home. We look forward to touring the facility later this afternoon or this morning, um, whenever we're done. Um, today is rather landmark in that for the first time since my tenure in the House of Representatives, we have both the House Veteran Affairs and Emergency Preparedness Committee and the House Aging and Older Adult Service Committee joined together to examine the needs of our aging veteran population. I think it's a great opportunity for both committees and the department to get a full picture of current programs and the existing needs of our veteran community and their families and to strengthen our ability to work together towards a common goal which is to help residents of our great commonwealth and to assist them in their time of need. With that I will now turn over the microphone to Majority Chairman um, Tim Hennessy for remarks and then followed by Chairman Chris Sonato and then Chairman Samuelson. Okay. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Southeast Veterans Center. Uh, welcome to my district. I'm. Uh, it's a. First, let me first say that this has been a pleasure to be here. Uh, have Southeast Veterans Center in my district for all these many years, since 2000 and. Two, I think uh, I took over uh, when with redistricting I, I had uh, assigned to me East Vincent Township uh, and with that came the opportunity to sit on the advisory committee here at Southeast Veterans Center as a representative of the Speaker of the House, presently Mike Terzai. Uh, 
and I report back to him in terms of the issues that uh, arise here at Southeast Veterans Center. I will say that it is one of the finest veteran centers uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, we have a very proud history and a proud tradition. We've got a wonderful staff and an administrative staff here uh, for at Southeast, and we take fantastic care of our veterans. Um, you're going to see uh, the, the new facility uh, as part of the tour a little, in a little bit. Uh, it's, I had referred to it the Alzheimer's unit. It's really a, a much broader focus uh, on mental uh, health issues for our veterans here. But it's a building that opened in about five or six years ago. Uh, I was under the impression it was costing $30 million. I'm told that by the time it was done, it was closer to maybe $60 million. Um, but it's, it is a fantastic uh, new building and a new enterprise here at uh, Southeast Veteran Center. Uh, so keep your eyes open, enjoy the tour. You're going to see a very, very fine uh, home here. I appreciate uh, Chairman Barrar agreeing that we do a, a joint hearing today <coughs> on, on aging issues and aging programs as they affect the veteran population. Uh, it's, it's a focus that we haven't really put on uh, things specifically uh, before, uh, and we're happy to do that today. And I want to, again, welcome you all here to my district. And uh, those of you who didn't apply for a daily visa, I'm going to waive that obligation today. You don't need that visa to be here in the 26th district. Thank you. Okay. Chairman Senator. Thank you, Chairman Barrar, Chairman Hennessy. Uh, it is a privilege to be in the 26th District uh, and to uh, be here today. I know our committee uh, toured this, I think, around six, seven years ago, and where there was things under construction, and we saw things then. So we look forward to that today, look forward to the testimony, and uh, it's just great to see so many of our colleagues uh, participating today. We thank each and every one of you uh, for coming uh, for this important hearing. So thank you. Thank you, Chairman Sonato. I, absolutely, I'd like to thank the men, members for um, the great turnout that we have here today um, amongst the, the both committees here. At this time, I will call up Deputy Com Commandant Mildred Butler Coleman for some welcoming remarks. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much. Welcome on behalf of the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. Mildred. Do you want to, uh, would you take a seat? For a Just so you have a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. On behalf of the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs, we welcome you to the Southeast Veterans Center in beautiful Chester County. We've been serving veterans since 1986. That's when this first building opened, and then we have the newer building that you'll tour um, in a couple hours, if, if you so desire. We'll be doing tours, but we wanted to let you know that we serve 290 veterans or spouses of veterans. Those are the criteria we have for admission. If you're not a vet, but you're a spouse of a vet, you're welcome to come here. Uh, most of our vets, we have 290 that we're, we are licensed to serve, 50 on a personal care level, which are more independent boarding home level residents, and then we have the balance of 235 or so that are in our skilled nursing area, which is more of a medical assisted kind of unit. Um, after the official hearing, you'll be welcome to stay for lunch, and um, we'll be serving lunch in our resident mess hall. It's military lingo, and you will be escorted to the dining area where you'll be able to enjoy lunch with the veterans. The personal care guys and gals eat in the Tillman Hall, and you'll be able to have lunch with them, and it will be cafeteria style. So we'll be escorting you down. We'll um, have you get a tray and join everybody and have lunch. Um, and just so you know, around 11 o'clock, this is a <coughs> medical facility with regulations, as you well know, we have a fire drill, which will be up on the fourth floor, right above our heads, about three floors up. It's just for that unit. If you hear bells ring, it'll be okay. Continue on. Hopefully it won't interfere with the mic or your um, ability to be able to communicate. But the fourth floor has to do their annual fire drill. It's part of the regulation, and we want to be compliant. So we thank you in, in advance for your consideration in that particular event. Any questions, I'll be in the area, and you can just grab me, and I'll be happy to assist. Great. Thank you, thank sir. Thank you. Okay. At this time, I call up Major General er Eric Weller, who is the Pennsylvania Deputy Adjutant General for Veteran Affairs under the Department of Military and Veteran Affairs. It is a pleasure to have you here with us today, General. 
and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate, uh, appreciate that. I've got my crutch here with me, uh, Mr. Hamp, my special assistant, uh, assistant uh, in case anybody asks anything above, any questions above a high school level, uh, he's the guy to answer them, so. <laughs> I'll uh, jump right into it, if that's okay. Um, good morning, uh, uh, committee chairs, committee members. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you, and I know that you're also fellow advocates of uh, Pennsylvania's 820,000 veterans. Uh, you know, I'm really glad that you've allowed me to come here in order to help promote veterans advocacy. I've been on the job for about 21 months. I've obviously had the opportunity to work with a lot of dedicated people in the Office of Veterans Affairs. I've had the honor and privilege of meeting uh, members of all of the uh, various service organizations throughout the state, uh, two of which are represented here today, uh, Mr. Getz from the VSW, or VFW and uh, Mr. Foster from the American Legion. Uh, again, there are brothers in arms and uh, I absolutely appreciate the fact that you uh, are giving them an opportunity to speak today. Uh, I've had the uh, opportunity to meet with the uh, State Veterans Commission about once every uh, two months, the uh, Pennsylvania War Council about once every two months, uh, the county commissioners on a quarterly basis, the county directors for Veterans Affairs or their executive board about every two months. Uh, I've had the opportunity to meet with a ton of 5013Cs and if you didn't know it, there's about 6,000 of them out there and I can't say that I know every one of them, but uh, uh, I'm trying. And then I've also had the opportunity to meet with uh, 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 obviously various legislatures such as yourself. I've noticed a lot of collaboration between all of the organizations and quite frankly I'm overwhelmed with just trying to get my arms around everybody that is supporting veterans. Our mission as it relates to veterans benefits are uh, to create awareness that the benefits exist, to educate people on what those benefits are and to help provide accessibility to those benefits and then obviously we have a legislative responsibility to care for our veterans. DMVA uh, uh, therefore is basically funded to handle three things. Number one is we do have a benefits program uh, which we call program services. We run uh, basically grant uh, uh, type programs for uh, people uh, blind and paralyzed veterans, amputees, that type of stuff all through state funding. Uh, we also have an outreach program and then we run or uh, administer six veterans homes all of which I'll talk about in a moment. So what I can do and what I also what I cannot do. Uh, number one, I, I just want to frame what my job is or what it is not. Uh, first of all, I can't afford to discount anybody or dislike anybody. Um, you know, obviously, uh, uh, everybody has an ego, and uh, my job is to try to get everybody, uh, everybody's egos in check and working together with each other, no matter who you are or what organization you're from. Uh, I don't write legislation. Uh, I don't direct the county directors for Veterans Affairs. I don't direct the uh, county commissioners. I don't direct the veteran service organizations. I don't direct the 5013Cs or, or other state governments, and sometimes even other agencies within DMVA. Um, but I can interact with all of these people. I can interact and try to get them to work together as I've alluded. Therefore, messaging is a big part of, of our, uh, uh, it's one of our highest priorities, sales and messaging, I should say. Some of the priority issues that we're working on now are preserving the Office of Veterans Affairs budget. Uh, supporting a regionalization concept, uh, which I'll talk more about in a moment. Uh, supporting mental health initiatives to the best that we can, and as you know, we are not funded to support any of them, actually. Uh, so we're trying to get creative on, on what we can do. Uh, and then also another priority is to establish uh, outreach into the rural areas for uh, additional capacity for uh, veterans' homes. As you know, uh, we took a significant cut in the 2017-2018 budget and that prompted a lot of studies. Uh, specifically, it made us look internally uh, 
number one, to justify all the manpower that we have. Uh, I have about 2,000 employees. Most of, so of them are associated with the uh, state veterans' homes. But I can tell you the function of each and every one of them. I can tell you why they exist, either through federal, state, local regulations, industrial standards. I can give you the time measurements, uh, you know, in relation to why I need so many custodians uh, in a building, the whole nine yards. So I have justified the people that we have. So that's that question is off the table. Another thing that we've done is taken the time to provide a five-year uh, plan, uh, mainly to the governor's budget office. And then we also did cost studies. There was a lot of talk about uh, uh, the expense of the state veterans' homes. So we took the time to do a cost study, uh, number one, to determine whether or not, compared to uh, the private economy, that if we are or are not charging too much money or spending too much money. So what we found is on the skilled care side of the house, we actually cost fi about $5 less per day per resident. On the uh, private care or personal care side, we're about $20 less per day. Uh, and then there was a lot of talk about privatization. Um, and so what we found there was that, uh, again, we're significantly less, uh, on the average, about $20 less per day if, if somebody would go ahead and try to privatize our entire state veterans' homes operation. Uh, and then we did compare ourselves with, uh, uh, you know, other uh, state agencies uh, and uh, uh, that have a similar operation and, and actually found that we're running about $100 a day less per resident per day. So, uh, how did we manage last year? It was very easy. Uh, I knew what I had to work with. I knew how many employees it would take to manage a certain number of uh, uh, veterans in our state homes, depending on the level of care that they needed. And that's basically how we managed. Uh, less uh, employees means less veterans that we can take care of. More, vet or more employees, more veterans we can take care of. The nice thing about it is the governor's budget office has told us, you know, you keep putting veterans in the homes and we'll help you find money. That's uh, very re refreshing for us. So this year in this budget, uh, we fared out uh, fairly well. Um, uh, we did receive at least a uh, cost of living increase, if you will. Uh, we also received a $500,000 increase on our Act 66 program. Uh, that's a program where we actually fund veteran service officers throughout the state to help veterans file mainly for their federal and sometimes state benefits. Uh, just to give you an idea, that 500000 uh, takes us up to $2.8 million as far as funding those individuals. Uh, we have over 100 of them that we fund, and uh, as far as a return on investment, which a lot of people don't look at, the return on investment is roughly $1 invested, $35 comes back into the state, mainly for the veteran, but the first time the veteran spends that dollar and keeps spending and keeps spending, it just has to change hands about 10 times and it becomes total state dollars. So one in 35 is fantastic in my opinion. Um, and if I could invest in the program and get that return, I certainly would. Uh, as far as, uh, again, as far as our budget, we also received a $100,000 increase for the Civil Air Patrol. That doesn't really have a lot, anything to do with uh, uh, the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. Uh, we're more or less a pass-through on that. And then we also received a $750,000 uh, legislative ad uh, for mental health uh, initiatives. Uh, again, that was uh, provided by the legislature. Uh, it is uh, uh, directed dollars, if you will uh, but we've been told if we can manage to get that into our budget and come up with a plan as to how we would help contribute towards uh, dealing with issues such as uh, just mental health issues PTSD drug and alcohol issues TBI those types of things that that money might start appearing on an annual basis so uh, that's another focus uh, that, that we've been uh, looking at. The bottom line is uh, we need your continued support and thank you for your past support. Uh, you know, some new programs of records that we'd like to establish or other things that we've been doing over the past year. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, you know, we've been starting to address or come up with a plan on how to look at mental health, drug and alcohol addiction, PTSD, homelessness, suicide prevention. 
uh, you know, partnerships by expanding the reach of our veterans' homes and a potential potentials there would be a potential county part or partnerships with the uh, uh, existing county homes uh, or the potential of building smaller homes and more uh, veterans' homes in more rural areas. Or the one that looks actually most interesting right now is some sort of a uh, partnership with private care facilities, uh, contracting out, uh, you know, perhaps uh, an existing wing in, in their facility and working with the federal VA to make sure we've got all the uh, right reimbursements in place. Uh, and then another initiative that we've got going is uh, uh, a startup for adult health daycare. Uh, and actually at this veterans home is where we're going to uh, start our pilot program and that should uh, hopefully be a reality within the next uh, two years. We've already laid the groundwork in case it is a success to establish another uh, adult health daycare facility in uh, Hollidaysburg. Other things that we're looking at uh, uh, as it relates to especially the service organizations and what they're interested in are issues such as aging in place, uh, potential privatization of some aspects of uh, various veterans operations. Uh, we spend a lot of time with incarcerated veterans. Uh, we do a lot of outreach in the prisons, especially the ones that have the uh, uh, veteran service units. Uh, we've been uh, corresponding and are meeting a lot with uh, uh, AOPC as it relates to veterans courts uh, and quite frankly we've committed to once they start expanding their program and again they're looking at regionalizing the remaining counties that don't have a veterans court uh, we, we've uh, offered assistance in relation to marketing and or uh, helping them stand up mentorship programs for each one of those courts uh, we're also looking at, uh, uh, with DOC, at post-sentence testing for incarcerated veterans. Through all of this, though, what do I see? And quite frankly, I see a lot of or uh, good organizations doing a lot of good things on behalf of veterans. Another thing I see is a lot of good people and organizations doing a lot of good things on behalf of veterans that don't network with each other. Uh, so as I've been looking at this, I ask myself the question, does everybody know everything? And the answer is no. And what are some of the keys to success? Number one is to organize, and number two is to educate. Number three would be to provide an information or a forum for information exchange. Uh, so as I'm looking at how we're going to move into the future, uh, I keep asking myself the question, am I going to receive more money in my budget? I don't know the answer to that, so I have to take the negative side and say, I probably won't. I'm hoping that I do, but I probably won't. So does that mean that my job ends, though? Uh, and I refer back to those issues that I was talking about earlier, the, the items that I'm not funded to take care of or participate in, all the mental health issues, homelessness, so on and so forth. So as a result, uh, I keep asking myself, what is out there already that, that we can tap into? And uh, you know, quite frankly, the, the basis for what I think that we need to tap into from our organization is a lot of the pro premier 5013Cs. And uh, uh, I'll name a few of them in just a moment. Uh, but anyway, so we're documenting a plan uh, where we've divided the state into about five regions that house at least two of these premier organizations uh, in each region. Who better than to know the, issue, or the issues in their region than these 5013Cs? So anyways, uh, I, I'll just give you an example of some of them. Uh, Veterans Leadership Program out of Pittsburgh, uh, Veterans Community Initiatives out of Johnstown, uh, YWCA and, uh, out of Harrisburg. Uh, I know you're asking yourself, YWCA, what's that got to do with anything? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, Veterans Multi-Service Center Philadelphia, Multi-Service Center Central Pennsylvania, Lackawanna Workforce Development Veterans Resource Coalition, an uh, organization called Hands Up in Erie, another organization called Coats up in Erie, another organization uh, near here, Lehigh Valley Military uh, Affairs Council. The bottom line is what do each one of these organizations have in common? Uh, basically, the, the basis for each one of those organizations is to deal with homelessness. So, what else do they deal with? And that's my next question. Well, uh, the contributing factor towards homelessness. And that's where we get into all of the other things that we're not funded to deal with here. Uh, TBI, PTSD, drug and alcohol issues, lack of employment, so on and so forth. 
so anyways, all of these organizations are involved in either providing direct or indirect referrals uh, for homeless people that have those types of issues. So yes, I should get my arms around them pretty quick. And that's what I, uh, what I plan on doing. My goal is to provide a forum for all of these organizations, including the county directors, state offices, service organizations, and other 5013Cs to uh, cross-tell. Another uh, goal is to provide a forum for direct interaction between these agencies. Another goal is to find out what all the holes are in each region that I can help plug. You know, the bottom line, though, is I really want to set up an informational network so that if I have, let's say, a county director up in Erie that's got a veteran that has a severe PTSD issue, that he or she knows that there's actually an organization out there that can help them, uh, a 5013C, maybe down in Quakertown, Pennsylvania, or in uh, Lancaster, uh, because that information is just not available in any one spot. So, back to the framework of my job. The bottom line is I don't want to be a figurehead. Uh, talk is cheap, results take effort, and, and I'm willing to put forth the effort. I'm very grateful for the participation and or support of legislators, state agencies, the PA War Council, State Veterans uh, Commission, uh, another organization which I chair, the Governor Advisory Council for Veteran Services, which is made up of a lot of state agencies divided into various committees, uh, Aging Committee, uh, Education and Employment Committee, Behavioral Health Committee, uh, Judiciary Committee, Office of Administration Committee, Suicide Peer Prevention Committee. Uh, that's where we are able to get a lot of the state agencies together and cross-pollinate. And all I'm really doing, is, uh, and when I talk about regionalization, is looking for a way to start including everybody else in that, uh, that type of forum. I'm also thankful for all of the people that participate in the uh, Home Advisory Councils, uh, County Directors for Veterans Affairs, County Commissioners, all the 5013Cs, and all the service organizations, especially that are in your counties. Bottom line is we need to do a better job in telling our story. I tell all the veterans organizations that we have a voice, but unless we speak cohesively, nobody's going to listen to us. And why is it so important? Well, the example I give is in relation to veterans issues uh, at the state and federal level 40, 50 years ago, uh, above 70% of our legislators were veterans. Now we're down to about 20%. Therefore, we need to get out and not only educate all of you, but people in all of the other agencies in relation to what it is in, uh, to be a veteran. So, as a private citizen and a veteran, I thank you for speaking on our behalf. God bless you. God bless the Commonwealth. And I'm ready for any questions. Or Great. Mr. Hamp is ready for any questions. Thank you. Okay. Tim, did you have questions? No. Chair? Just uh, the adult... Uh, the adult, day, the adult health daycare uh, center. Have you guys uh, spoken? Is it? I'm sorry. Have you guys spoken with Manitoni Manor, three or four miles down the road? Because I think that they m would be interested in, in partnering with you in terms of some sort of a, a daycare uh, program. Mm -hmm. uh, I've talked to them before, and uh, they have an interest. So this is one asset you might want to keep in mind or a resource. Copy that. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Yes, yeah, let me follow up on um, Ch Chairman Hennessy's comments about the adult daycare. This this is really an important um, program out there, as as this is incorporated incorporated <clears throat> hopefully into all our, our um, veteran state homes. Are, are you looking at in this, are you looking at transportation? Exactly how will you, how do you approach who's, who you're going to accept who, and who you're not and how are we going to get them here and get them home? Well, uh, actually, we've established a radius. Uh, I can't tell you what that is off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, but anyways, uh, we'll bring in people from uh, from within that radius, and it'll be kind of a uh, uh, a medical profile for our, our adult health daycare. Uh, uh, we'll be able to go pick them up, bring them here. Uh, take care of any needs or issues that they have during the day, uh, not just to have them here to entertain them. I mean, we, we'll be able to, you know, bring people who are, are, you know, in that type of situation where they actually need supervision and or help. Uh, so it's not just going to be a place to, you know, drop your child off or, you know what I mean? It's not like a daycare center in that regard. Right. 
so uh, and then at the end of the day we'll be taking them back home again uh, we also will receive uh, federal reimbursement for a significant portion of that program uh, so you know we're hoping that it's going to be cost neutral are, are, the, are the feds you, I know the feds are putting money into this is it is it do you see that possibly being an expanding pool of money that will be available to the state for um, this type of program yes sir Yep. In fact, I believe there, uh, there uh, as it as it exists right now, you know, that's what we're saying, and we think it's going to be cost neutral. They're actually looking at increasing the dollar amount, so uh, you know, we should be able to, uh, you know, we won't have to have to scrimp. I mean, it should be mostly mostly total federal reimbursement. Is yeah, I, I think there's a, a savings there in a fa in the sense that you're not. You're not ad admitting them full time into the into the the home here, where they're here for a daycare um, type situation, and they're going back home to their, you know, to their family, which is a, I think a, a, a I, I don't know how you calculate that savings, but I'm pretty sure it's it's a savings if they can do, you know, kind of like the community care that we do um, in, in in some of the other um, programs that I'm sure Tim's more familiar with. But, sure. Um, yeah. Right. Well, actually, what we're what we're doing now with within our homes, so what we're finding is the uh, proponents of people that we get in are really they're in dire straits. Uh, they're with us for less than two years. Uh, but anyways, most people require a skilled care setting. We did have uh, personal care throughout all of our homes, but again, the need is more on the on the skilled care side of the house. Mm -hmm. So we've started reducing the number of personal care beds uh, you know, to increase where the need really is. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying that adult health daycare takes the place of personal care. Right. But it will help offset that. Mm -hmm. Great. Chairman Senato, questions? No, I just want to thank you for your, your testimony. I think it was very enlightening. Uh, we thank you for your service, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. OK. Um, let me start with um, Representative Barbin. Oh, that's OK. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. And thank you, General oh, Weller. Okay. Do you expect in the, you know, the next 10 years that the amount of applications that go to the, we have the six veterans homes, do you expect those to increase based on our 820,000 veterans and our 3.5 million number for the families? Is that a, do you, do you plan for an increase in population of people that will need to serve? Mm -hmm. We're assuming that there, there will be an, an increased need and, and quite frankly the focus area is probably going to start shifting at some point where we're going to be getting people that have yeah, other issues besides just aging uh, people that have you know the the PTSD issues that also require long-term care setting uh, you know those types of things so yeah we we think that number one the the need is going to increase but then the other thing that that we're trying to address is the fact that um, you know we don't serve a lot of the rural areas uh, especially in s central Pennsylvania uh, well, actually, the central PA and then along the uh, northern tier. Uh, so we're we're trying to, you know, address all of those types of things, and that's where uh, I talk about, uh, you know, looking for a way to cut costs, but at the same time provide a service, uh, and that might be a partnership with the county homes or partnership with private care facilities or just building smaller facilities in in those regions. Well, I only have one comment, and I appreciate the, uh, your testimony today. This morning as I was driving in, I was listening to National Public Radio, and one of the stories they had was about the Carson Long Institute, mm -hmm. and that serves, or did serve, as a veteran school, and that their students are now moving to Valley Forge, but they're listing that property for $4 million, mm -hmm. and it is located conveniently. I, you know, I used to live in Perry County. It's right in off in New Bloomfield off of 322 and since we know we're going to have needs whether they're mental health issue needs or whether they're going to be additional people and they need senior health care needs we should look at that because we lost a facility that we could have used with the Scotland School for Veterans Children and I'm just 
Well, I, I'm just asking that you take a look at that facility because at $4 million, yes. that would seem to be a good expenditure to deal with the long-term problems that we're going to need to address for veterans. Yes, sir. <coughs> Thank you. Is it? Okay. Um, Representative Delicio. Thank you, Chairman. General, I could chat with you all day. Oh, okay. I look forward to it. In, in no do, you, do you have any money? I'm sorry, General. <laughs> We're going to ask you to keep it to five minutes, though. <laughs> I'll, I'll do better than that. I worked with Chairman Hennessy. <laughs> the, uh, in no particular order, I would urge you to look at these public-private partnerships. I come out of the long-term care field times 30 years, and um, you know some of the programs that you talk about are well-established on the private sector, so to the degree that you can uh, find ways to work together, learn from someone else's mistakes, Stakes, layer on what uh, the subset of veteran older adults may need mm -hmm. may help to expedite some of your vision becoming a reality. Uh, to that end, I would encourage you when you talked about um, networking, mm -hmm. there is a 211 system in Pennsylvania, and I was trying to look up on my phone, but I didn't have internet here, to see if that 211 network might actually be a resource for your um, veteran officers out in the counties who are trying trying to um, help disseminate information. So if the 211 system currently doesn't have veteran specific information, maybe that's something that can be added to that system to help. Um, I would be curious when you mention costs and that these costs are um, competitive with or more efficient than the private sector. In general, I would be interested in seeing those numbers uh, behind that because I know I sat at an appropriations hearings a few years back and um, that didn't seem to be the case a few years ago, at least for some of the veteran centers. So I would be um, curious about that. And then um, in terms of, is there a currently a waiting list for uh, the facility-based services, the personal care, and the skilled care that's currently offered? Yes, there, there is a, a waiting list. The uh, uh, mostly on the non-veteran side of the house, uh, you know, based on federal, you know, guidance and or standards, uh, I have to have, 75 percent of my residents have to be a, a veteran, uh, a veteran with benefits, I should say. Uh, so the other 25 percent, you know, generally would be funded either through themselves or with, uh, you know, some form of state funding maybe or whatever. But the bottom line is in order to drive costs down, we've limited ourselves to 12% non-veterans. Uh, so most of the people that you see on our waiting list are what we would call non-veterans. Uh, generally, they're either spouses of veterans, uh, man or woman, or uh, they're what's classified as a veteran without benefits, and that might be a, a reservist who's you know never uh, deployed overseas. Um, so, uh, veterans have preference, uh, basically, is what I'm trying to get at uh, as far as uh, uh, b accessibility to our homes. And then my last question, has the department ever considered, or does the department have within its um, resources currently, offer any type of independent living setting for veterans, uh, or a continuing care retirement community type of setting where folks may come in earlier, and as a result of your resources remain healthier longer before they may need these other levels of care and services that are more intense and therefore more costly. Right. Uh, we don't have any, any programs. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, we've been joined by um, Chairman um, Samuelson and also by Representative Costa have um, come in since we've done introductions. Okay. Um, next question from um, Representative Saccone. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, General Weller, for sure. what you do for our veterans. Um, 
talk, you talked a little bit about telling our story, getting the word out. How's our veterans registry program doing? I know General Corelli was he's a big fan of that. He carries these little cards around with him too. Mm-hmm. I still carry mine around. He's been an inspiration to me to do that. And when I meet people who aren't don't know about what's going on with our veterans programs, we try to get them into the program. Have we? What's the increase been? Have we been doing well with that? Is the program working? We we have. There's pro- approximately twelve thousand people signed up. Uh, you know for that. Uh, program obviously we'd like to see it increase but uh, and we're trying to think of ways to to get that that number to increase uh, I guess so putting it in perspective um, w- one number that I will say that uh, I see out there it comes from the federal side of the house it, it basically says that about half of the 820,000 veterans in our state a little bit less than half are aware of at least the federal benefits maybe not quite so aware of the state benefits so the the issue's kind of been addressed but you know we want to increase our number of 12,000 and get that much higher so we're trying to think of uh, of, of additional ways to market that uh, uh, market that program so let me suggest to you that you know you we have 203 representatives and 50 senators they all have web pages we all have I bet most of us have veteran service officers in our offices you know at least once a month um, we can advertise that. We can help advertise that. Some of us already do, I know, but we um, maybe you should work with our PR section in the in the House and the Senate to advertise that out because we reach lots of constituents and it, you know it may help to expand the, the number that join up, uh, register for that. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, um, Representative Ryan. Uh, sir, I think in the interest of time, there I, I'll keep a couple of the questions real quick. The other ones I think we can do at the end. General, you and I had talked at a prior hearing about the cost to uh, to duplicate what Representative Delisio said, and it, the reports that I had examined showed that the cost in the state facilities from a labor component were substantially higher than the cost of, of outside agencies. And the question I was asking is, where are the cost of the facilities shown the cost of post-retirement benefits, which did not appear from my uh, analysis and from work that I'd done uh, in some reports I'd from the Auditor General staff, it, sh- it seems as if they are shown different places in the budget, either being absorbed by the federal government. And, and that's not to say that, that any of us think that the money could be spent better. I happen to believe that you get an acuity of care that's significantly more complex than most senior facilities see, although Representative Delisio would know better than I. Uh, so the question I have for you is, is uh, I had asked a number of questions at that point about where some of these costs were showing up so we could really determine what the level of cost structure was uh, so that uh, those of us who either have an accounting background or a long-term care background could really take a look to make sure that the veterans are, are being served properly. Yes, I'm not not quite sure how to answer that. Uh, yeah, we, we can probably, do it, we can do it offline yeah. if you prefer. Because it's a complicated well, a- question. Actually, I do want to answer the question though. We we okay, publish uh, we publish our costs. I call it the Farmer's Almanac, but what what is it uh, called? <laughs> the Pennsylvania Bulletin. Pennsylvania that's Bulletin. It, that's it. Okay, so that that's uh, but that's an all inclusive cost. I mean, that's everything. That's great. Uh, that doesn't take into account uh, you know reimbursements of any type, whether it's state, federal, local, whatever. That, that's just I'm just telling you what my total cost is. So when we did a cost comparison in relation to uh, you know cost data, I mean we actually got that information. Uh, 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 cost data sheets that all of the private care facilities and every facility that has long-term care reports on. And what we found when we looked at, at that particular sheet was that a lot of costs were not included. Um, you know, i.e. transportation to and from the hospital. Uh, cost of a haircut. Uh, cost of... I saw you took advantage of that. Um, yeah, I got the haircut this morning. Right. Uh, cost of pharmacy. But the point is, it's a cost. It's a cost to the veteran. So once you start, you know, Absolutely. so at first we were comparing apples to oranges, and yeah, yeah, based on the raw numbers, oh my God, we're twice as much as everybody else. But when you start comparing apples to apples and consider the cost of the veteran, that's where we're actually lower than everybody else. Now, as far as the... Uh, 
uh, cost of care, I can tell you that our PPD rates are at uh, 3.8 for dementia type patients, two, or 3.2 for skilled care, and 1.0 for uh, personal care. That's only direct care workers. That does not include anybody else. That's the CNAs, the LPNs, the RNs. That doesn't include an accountants or lawyers or people like me. You, you know what I mean? Sure. Uh, so. Uh, again, our, our endeavor was not only to pr provide a, a, a direct apples to apples comparison, but also guarantee you that we are, when we say we're providing this level of care, that's exactly what we're doing. No, no in, in fact, I appreciate that. That's actually some of the things I wanted to get to is that uh, on the Veterans Affairs side of this, we've had discussions in the past, as an example, when a Pennsylvania National Guardsman deploys, is the federal government really reimbursing us for the full cost? And this is part of the area where I don't believe the federal government is. And that as a result, the reimbursement rates, while they appear to be a reimbursement rate at a standard rate, is certainly well below the cost of care. So as a result, then Pennsylvania taxpayers are subsidizing it. Concurrent with that frequently, the veteran uh, is, we're trying to do more and more with less and less to the point where we're expecting you to do everything with nothing. Right. And, and so as a result, uh, what I want to really do is sit down, uh, dissect the cost, find out, as an example, there, are, there may be problems in the reimbursement rates in the private sector, uh, where I hear that concern on a regular basis in our committee meetings. So I would enjoy working with you, but I would like to go over the, the questions that I'd asked a number of months ago, because I still think, and, and Representative Dulce, I'd like to work with you on that, because I've got the accounting end of it. I don't have the long-term care end of it. I just think that there's a component of this that we're missing that's costing a lot more, not in terms of uh, total cost, but in terms of reimbursement from the state vis-a-vis -vis what might be coming back from the federal government. Right. Well, and and part, part, of the, uh, part of the issue there is, uh, you know, when I, I, I refer to veterans without benefits. Uh, actually, that's a step in the right direction as far as federal legislation. Uh, previously, those people were not considered veterans at all. And again, I refer to reservists that have not deployed or hold a DD-214 card. So step one was just to get them, uh, get people to acknowledge them as a veteran. I call them veterans without benefits. So you're right; they they don't get, they don't qualify for benefits, but at least they're known as veterans. So I think step two on the federal side, which I believe some of the legislators are looking to attack, is adding that benefits part on, uh, onto those uh, those people. Okay, thanks for great. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> uh, General Waller, you had uh, mentioned maintenance fees uh, and residence fees, and I was curious as to the trend line. I think you mentioned in your testimony that only 2% of the residents are actually paying the real cost of their care. Um, what is the trend? What has the trend been in terms of uh, their being able to cover uh, cost of care? I, I, gathering since it's at a 2% level, the trend line had to have been down. And do you anticipate a decline over time in a resident's ability to participate in the cost of their care? And how will that affect your budget if indeed the trend line is down? I'm gathering maybe substantially so over time. Uh, I'm I'm not sure the best way to answer the question. Uh, I, I can tell you that on the average, uh, actually in both personal and skilled care, on the average across the board, uh, people pay about $40 per day for their care out of their own pocket. Uh, so the remaining amount, either we get reimbursement either through state funding, Federal funding, or you know, some other type of uh, type of insurance. I think that's been holding fairly uh, fairly steady. We keep a close eye on that, though. And uh, what we're trying to do is drive up the federal reimbursements so that we can drive down the cost to the state, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I think in answer to your question, I, I think we're kind of level on the average of what people in our facilities can pay. At the same time, though, we're trying to drive up the federal reimbursement costs, and the question is, how, how are we doing that? 
well, we're going back and looking at, at veterans that are currently in our homes, you know, as their health may decline, and refile for additional benefits is really what it boils down to. So we're constantly looking or we're starting to constantly look at their medical records, their, their, their medical issues, and the more benefits that we can file for for reimbursement on the federal side, you know, the less we pay on the state side, uh, it's, but as far as uh, the average, I, I would say it's, it's maintained uh, probably the same for about the last three years. Okay. Thank you, General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, what is the um, federal per diem rate at, at this point right now? Do you know? The reimbursement rate? Oh, uh, again, I can only speak in, in broad numbers, but roughly half of our budget is uh, federal reimbursement. Okay. So if my but, but you get a per diem per veteran. Right. Well, each, each each veteran varies. Oh, uh, okay. Some may be 100% uh, reimbursement. Others, you know, maybe 50%. Uh, okay. It just depends on the veteran. We have. We want to. We're we're falling behind on our schedule. Um, are you going? Can you stay around to the end of the hearing, yes, or sir. do you have plans to leave? Um. um okay. My plan. Great. Is if you can stay, maybe we can get back. There's several other people who've asked to ask questions, but I'd really like to get to Secretary Osborne. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Oops. Thank you, General. Thank you, Rick. Madam Secretary. While the secretary takes her place at the table, uh, let me just say that it's a pleasure for me to introduce Secretary Teresa Osborne from, I believe, Lackawanna County. Yes, sir. Uh, up in the Poconos. We've known Secretary Osborne as the Secretary of Aging and Older Adult Services uh, in Pennsylvania since 2015 with the, at the beginning of the Wolf Administration. But many of us on the Aging and Older Adult Services Committee have known Teresa for a much longer period of time than that because of her advocacy in Lackawanna County uh, through the AAA system and and uh, I think for some of the uh, senior care centers up there. She's been a strong advocate for our senior population. She's probably going to mention the year 2020. She always works that <laughs> into her remarks. Uh, and it's a significant uh, thing for all of us to remember uh, the, the size of our senior population, growing and ever growing. Uh, so with that, let me welcome you to Southeast Veterans Center here, and you can be begin your testimony whenever you're ready. Thanks, Thank Chairman. You. Thank you so much to Chairman Hennessy and Chairman Brar and Samuelson and Senato. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here with you today uh, for what was described in the opening remarks by Chairman Brar, a landmark joint hearing on programs and assistance for aging our aging veteran population here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm privileged to serve as the Secretary of Aging and thank Chairman Hennessy for his kind words. Uh, our roots do go back pretty far with regard to um, my testimony at various hearings when, when the Chairman served in, uh, as, the, as the Chair in the Rendell Administration with uh, Phyllis Monday at that time. And we had several uh, landmark cases of neglect of care dependent persons that uh, paused the General Assembly to make some enhancements to that law. So that's where our paths first crossed. And and I'm ever so grateful and privileged to serve in this role today. As the Secretary for the Pennsylvania Department of Aging, our Department of Aging is formally charged under federal government uh, via the Older Americans Act, which is celebrating its 53rd anniversary this year and is up for reauthorization in 2019. So next year will be an interesting year uh, with regard to the funding that we receive under the Older Americans Act. We're also charged under the Pennsylvania General Assembly's Act 71. And both of those responsibilities responsibilities, federal and state combined, calls us to be visible and effective advocates for the interests and well-being of all older Pennsylvanians. The Department of Aging was created in 1978, and it serves as the state unit on aging. Every state in the country is required to have a state unit on aging. The structure varies. Pennsylvania historically, um, since 1978, at least the last 40 years, has had its state unit on aging representing Pennsylvania's aging population, which currently is nearly three million people age 60 years of age and older and I wasn't prepared to comment on that perfect year that year of perfect vision uh, 2020 and by that year of perfect vision um, the year 2020 one in four Pennsylvanians will be age 60 
years of age and older. And in addition to overseeing an array of benefits and services and programs that are made available through our network, our network is comprised of 52 local area agencies on aging that cover the 67 Commonwealth counties of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And through that network of area agencies on aging, uh, we ensure that individuals have access to services and supports. All of you I know are familiar with the Pennsylvania's Benefits and Rights book for older Pennsylvanians and it really is a, a very popular uh, publication that outlines what the benefits and rights are for older Pennsylvanians including our aging veterans which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail. But the department under our charge federally and, and, and statewide, we're responsible to represent the Commonwealth's interests and the design, the implementation, and the continuous improvement of long-term services and supports for older Pennsylvanians and across all state agencies. To this end, to Major General Weller's good points that he just raised, it's critical that the Department of Aging works in communication and collaboration and coordination with our sister state agencies. Every day we recognize that the individuals that we are called to serve include men and women who serve their country. They come home and they often struggle. They struggle to locate and to access home and community based services for which they are eligible. Moreover, in consideration of the very high number of veterans who are aged 60 years and over, and of that 820,000 number that Major General Weller mentioned, nearly half of those are, are aged 65 years of age and older. So it's imperative critically imperative that the Department of Aging works in tandem with the Pennsylvania Department of Military and Veterans Affairs in particular in order to connect our growing aging population, our aging veterans and their caregivers with the available resources that will help them live and age well with the dignity and respect that they deserve. Those resources need to be better leveraged via federal services and dollars that are available as the Major General just spoke about, state programs and services as well as local via those public-private partnerships with a, a vast array of Pennsylvania's uh, nonprofit entities and I'll talk about that a little bit more. But first I'll comment on Veterans Day 2013 because it was then that the Governor's Advisory Council on Veteran Services was established. It was Pennsylvania's first interagency cooperative approach to veteran services. This council is critical as Major General Weller mentioned. It's responsible to review, to evaluate and assess state veterans programs in collaboration with senior staff from all state agencies and commissions. And this approach, this collaborative approach, ensures that information is shared, ensures that program fidelity is met, it coordinates complementary programs, and facilitates much more meaningful enhancements in service accessibility to veterans benefits and services within Pennsylvania. As required under, under this uh, particular advisory council, I was required to designate designate a key staff member from the Pennsylvania Department of Aging to serve as my designee. That individual is Samantha Kosman. Samantha currently is the Northwest Pennsylvania Regional Coordinator of the Pennsylvania Department of Aging's Aging and Disability Resource Center. Samantha serves as my designee and is thus responsible to be the key person to communicate with me to be certain, but also to be a liaison to this commission in order to ensure that the department upholds its responsibility to provide the council with the support, resources, and information necessary in the aging services arena to fulfill its duties. Currently, Ms. Kostman also serves as the co-chair for one of the committees of the council that Major General Weller just talked about, and that is the council's aging committee. Ms. Kostman works in partnership with Ed Beck, who is the chief of operations for the DMVA's state veterans' homes, specifically, specifically to address the needs of our aging veterans. That opportunity to work collaboratively has been embraced, not just by the Department of Military and Veterans and Services, but also the Department of Aging. And that embracement is evident by the efforts and the initiatives that have been launched to better connect Pennsylvania's network of local area agencies on aging, those 52 local area agencies on aging that cover the 67 counties of our Commonwealth, with the Pennsylvania's County Directors of Veterans Affairs, all to ensure that Pennsylvania's qualified aging veterans and their families can access needed benefits and services and supports when they need them. To provide you just with the sense of these efforts, I'm pleased to share a few of the following examples. Earlier this year, we launched a survey. The survey was conducted of all of our area to CN aging directors seeking very specific feedback on their current relationship with their local county directors of veterans affairs. 
While the survey was intended to identify gaps and to encourage communication and coordination at the local level, through this survey, best practices were also identified. Those pra best practices have been captured and we will be sharing them shortly with the network in order to be a web so that the counties and the regions can learn from one another and to again better connect aging veterans and their families to available services and benefits that they may be eligible to receive. This survey also included a question. The question asked our local aging network, our local AAAs, if they were interested in helping the Commonwealth pursue expanding access to the Veterans Directed Home and Community Based Services Program. Members of the aging committee might be most familiar, but members of the other committee might be as well with Pennsylvania's current aging waiver program. That program is intended to ensure that individuals can age in place. If they're eligible for medical assistance and eligible for nursing facility level of care, they can receive services and supports in their home as opposed to living in an institution. The Veterans Directed Home and Community Based Service Program is a federal program designed to allow veterans who are indeed potential candidates for nursing home placement to receive that care in their homes, their caregivers' homes, or as Representative Delicio pointed out earlier, in a non-supportive independent living community. The Veterans Directed Program, this federal program, provides the veteran with a budget and allows them to choose their own care providers in place of receiving care services in, in the Veterans Administration health care system. In some cases, family members of the veteran can be paid for the care which they provide. This Veterans Directed Home and Community-Based Service Program is presently only available in the Philadelphia, Coatesville, and Erie areas. The survey results yielded that multiple AAAs, which are within a Veterans Integrated Service Network, VISN, also known as a VISN, which indeed these air agencies and aging, many of them were interested in exploring this expansion. At present, thankfully, leadership from the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs is in communication with VISN 4, which is again the Veterans Integrated Service Network that Pennsylvania participates in to determine if VISN 4 will work with Pennsylvania to, pr pr to pursue expanding this federally funded service expansion here for Pennsylvania's aging veterans. Another initiative involved the Pennsylvania Department of Aging's Aging and Disability Resource Center, also known as the PA Link. It was last year, our first opportunity, and we're expanding it into this year, that we delivered jointly with Department of Military and Veterans Affairs a Veterans Day message. The message was created in that collaborative opportunity in order to first and foremost recognize veterans' military service, to highlight the needs of aging veterans, and to create pathways, pathways to better educate and connect our aging veterans and their caregivers to available services, which again, they may be eligible for. In addition, this PA Link partnership, which is very much modeled upon what Major General Weller commented on, as well as Representative Delicio with the 211 system, because through our PA Link leadership, we are currently leading conversations with all types of uh, public and private partners in order to have them register on our PA Link to Community Care website. And most recently, we're engaged in leading conversations with the DMVA and its local county veterans assistance offices to create connections with Pennsylvania's two Alzheimer's Association. Association chapters, the Greater Pennsylvania chapter of the Alzheimer's Association and the Delaware Valley chapter, which has a footprint here in particular in southeastern Pennsylvania, in order to either develop or to strengthen partnerships so that Pennsylvania veterans with Alzheimer's disease or other related dementias and their caregivers can be much more quickly linked to the needed support and respite and services that they need and desire. These PA Link partnerships are, are a critical part of our opportunity to better leverage the resources that are entrusted to our care and that we better utilize them well and wisely. Lastly, I'd like to comment on the work that is underway to ensure, as the, as the representative's good question earlier was raised, that the statutory requirements of Act 69 of 2017 are actually met and that the DMVA is supported and therefore successful in ensuring that its responsibility to ask those 
seeking services from all state agencies in their agents, and in our case, it's the local area agencies on aging, ask them if they ever served the United States Armed Forces, and then to help any veteran who desires to be included in the Veterans Registry to register. This exercise under X69 will help us to locate every veteran in the Commonwealth in order to provide outreach and information and actually link them, link them with the available services and benefits that they so desperately in many cases need. With guidance from the Governor's Advisory Council on Veterans Services and its Aging Committee, the Aging Network is currently being educated on X69 so that we can ensure that at the first point of contact, each caller is being asked if they are a veteran, and if so, they're then educated on the Pennsylvania's Veteran Registry, and support is offered in order to, again, I can't stress enough, ultimately link them to services and benefits that they may be eligible to receive. This opportunity to share some insight into how the Department of Aging strives to support our aging veterans in partnership with the DMVA in particular, but also with all of our sister state agencies is incredibly appreciated. And while exciting things are happening, we recognize that there's so much more that needs to be done. So much more so that our aging veterans and the baby boomers who are coming right behind them are informed, engaged, empowered, supported, and when necessary and needed, protected from all types of abuse, neglect, exploitation and abandonment. These brave Pennsylvanians who served our country and our commonwealth frankly deserve, as you all so well know, they deserve nothing less than our best efforts to support their desire to live independently and to age well and healthy in their homes and communities. I look forward to any suggestions that you may have as well as to answering any questions that you may have as well. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Do you have time for some questions? Absolutely. You do? Okay. Uh, let me just be, I don't have a question for you. Let me just begin by uh, thanking you for mentioning the, the uh, system of the AAAs across the Commonwealth. That is really the entry level call, I think, for most of our seniors, whether veterans or not, in terms of trying to access information about what services and programs are available for our, our senior population across Pennsylvania. Uh, and also, you gave a shout out a minute ago to the Delaware Valley Alzheimer's uh, Association. Uh, one of two in Pennsylvania. Um. We, we members of the House Aging Committee yesterday were uh, down at University of Pennsylvania, where we heard from the executive director of the uh, Alzheimer's Association uh, with an update on what their efforts are doing or are in in terms of doing things to help uh, people who face the. the trauma, so to speak, yeah. uh, of, of a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or some of the related disorders in that, uh, in that field. So um, thanks for mentioning them. They do fantastic work, as do our AAAs all across the uh, Commonwealth. Uh, Samuel. Uh, we have a, chair, a question for you from Chairman Samuelson. Thank you. So you, you said that you're, you did a survey of all the area agency and aging directors and all the veterans affairs directors around the state to talk, talk about whether they're collaborating. Um, in my county, Northampton County, they're co-located right in the same uh, building, the Human Services Building. I guess I'm curious, what did you find? Are they already working together in, in all the counties? That you surveyed? You know, well, well, I would wish that there was good relationships and good synergy as you experienced in Northampton County, and, and that was, by and large, more than half have those good relationships, but there was a good pocket, a good number of folks that said, you know what, there's been a lot of turnover, both at the Area Agency on Aging director side as well as in the, the county uh, uh, director side for the, for the local county veterans outreach office, and sometimes that turnover then led to not linking up with one another when, when there was a new director that came into place. So that was one opportunity that we felt we needed to help capture. Um, so we're, we're trying to create those synergies. Others, others, quite frankly, said that either you know that there, there's not a good relationship because of personality reasons or differences of philosophy or arguments over funding. So we're trying to break down those barriers and um, and ensure that we can have good positive relationships across all 67 counties. And just a follow-up question: You said the veterans' home and community-based services is only available in Philadelphia, Coatesville. And Erie. Yes. Why just those three areas? It, you know, it's it's a federal program, and certainly Major General Weller can can answer this probably much better than I can, because I needed to be educated on what exactly this this program is in relation to, for example, our own aging waiver program here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, as well as now the implementation of community health choices. But the Veterans Directed Home and Community Based Services program comes from the Veterans Health Administration, in particular their Office of Geriatrics and Extended Care, and it must be a partnership uh, with with the local 
local area agency on aging, either in a particular planning and service area or in a particular region, uh, as well as with the VA Medical Center. So it's the VA Medical Centers in Philadelphia and in Erie in particular, uh, in Coatesville, uh, those three VA Medical Centers that um, for many years now have had this veterans um, uh, program available. Um, we are now in conversation with the leadership of Vision 4. It, actually, it's being led by DMVA uh, because we have other Pennsylvania counties who line up with um, the other uh, veterans' homes in Pittsburgh, Butler, as well as Lebanon um, and Wilkesbury. In, in order to say, you know, area agencies and aging in those areas are willing to work with them and collaborate with them to expand this program in Pennsylvania, but it does need uh, federal approval um, in order to have Pennsylvania's desire to expand the program move forward because it is federal funded. Representative Delicia. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, just a comment. The Long-Term Care Council was reconstituted about two years ago. The Secretary heads it. I have the privilege of uh, being our caucus's appointee to it. There is a representative from the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs on it to help with some of these linkages. But I'm wondering, our current focus is direct care workers, of which there is a dearth, both on facility-based and community-based um, programs. and. I'm struck by the subsets of older adults in Pennsylvania, one of which is obviously veterans, why we're here today. The other is the intellectually disabled community, which are aging in place, and we haven't a clue. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, maybe this is a format, this idea of joint committee meetings, or for the council to look at these various subsets of our aging population, our older citizens, in the Commonwealth to ensure that our broader plan is addressing these subset needs which are unique to that demographic. Thank you. I know that wasn't really a question, but if I could just, uh, I, I, but I agree with everything you said for many and obvious reasons. And Representative Delicio, you, you're you're a voice at the table that is well appreciated at the Long Term Care Council. I know Chairman Hennessy is also on that council, and, and and Senator Brooks has a designee, Chloe, who re regularly represents her, and and um, and and Chairman. Um, um, whose name now just escapes me, so don't tell him that I forgot his name. Haywood, thank you. Yeah, nobody's going to tell him that, right? We're going to edit that out later. Um, but your Chairman Haywood, um, Liana represents him at the committee. But for our elected officials from the House and the Senate who serve on the Long-Term Care Council, it is deeply appreciated, the insight that you bring. And I'm not just saying that you know to, to earn points with anybody, um, but it's an incredibly important point that you just make up, that you just uh, uh, brought up, rather, with regard to our Pennsylvania Long-Term Care Council being reconstituted, certainly looking at direct care workers, because if we desire to be a Pennsylvania that enables its citizens to age in place, regardless of age or stage of life, each one of us has the same desire, and that's to live life in, in our home, in our community, whether that home is the home we raised our kids in, or the home that we downsized to, or the home that we moved into because we felt we needed you know, a different situation, but to age in place in the setting of our choice for as long as possible. And we can't do that without a direct care workforce that's available, that's accessible, that's respected, that has opportunity to earn life-sustaining, family-sustaining wages. So that is right now a, a critically important topic of the Long-Term Care Council. Uh, we did make sure that we included in that in that scope, um, in that space, uh, veterans' homes. And as as General Weller pointed out, you know, direct care workers in veterans' home are critically important. Direct care workers for veterans who receive aid and attendance, critically important. So we need to ensure that we're cr always looking at the direct care workforce. But to your good point, there is a certain subset here that we need to ensure across state agencies that we're looking at homelessness, we're looking at mental health, we're looking and learning from those counties that have treatment courts for veterans, and even using veterans as peers within that space. So I can obviously go on and on and on, and I won't. Um, but I, it, it is critically important, and we need to do better in these spaces in order to coordinate, communicate, and collaborate, and better leverage our resources. So, so thank you for that. Great. Um, Secretary Osborne, thank you for your testimony today. You're welcome to stay around. We're going to take some additional questions at the end of the hearing if sure. you have time. Absolutely. I think you might have a busy schedule. I'm not sure. But, um, no you're different than stay. anybody else's. But okay. Thank well, you. you can enjoy lunch with us then. <laughs> thank <laughs> you. Okay. We're going to call up our next panel. Mr. Bruce Foster, Department 
Service Officer, um, Pennsylvania American Legion, Mr. John B. Getz, Jr., State Adjutant, Quartermaster, Pennsylvania State Headquarters, Veterans of Foreign Wars. It's a pleasure, gentlemen, to have you here with us today. <clears throat> Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule, and um, you can begin your testimony when you're ready. All right, thank you. Good morning, Jack. Good morning, and thank you for providing me with an opportunity to present some information to you about the Pennsylvania Department of Veterans of Foreign Wars serves and assists older veterans, their survivors, and in part through the use of Act 66 funds. Pennsylvania VFW service officers outreach to a variety of office locations and events across Pennsylvania, reaching veterans in the majority of state 67 counties. Since Pennsylvania's Act 66 grant program was started, our state VFW has utilized grant funds to connect Pennsylvania veterans with well over $200 million in federal benefits. That's an impressive dollar amount and in return of our investments for these state grant funds is an incredible success story. These federal dollars have also resulted in a tremendous economic impact for Pennsylvania. Many older veterans are living better today because of Act 66. We so serve older veterans in offices of legislators, in fixed locations, in many outreach areas in rural Pennsylvania, at events like the Pennsylvania Farm Show, county fairs, military and veterans programs, local patriotic events, and elsewhere. We are here, when we hear about the older veteran who cannot travel, VFW service officers contact the aging veteran and offer to make a home visit with them. This means the world to them. We also visit aging surviving spouses of veterans for whom Living in the house creates a hardship. Our VFW service officer participates in many public events that honor older veterans. In fact, our hard work to help aging veterans receive the benefit and services that they have earned has resulted in special public presentation being honored to, to being held to honor those veterans now in their twilight years. Through the Veterans of Foreign Wars, service officers work at the VA medical centers and outreach facilities. We connect with the aging population and to initiate thousands of veteran claims and other support measures for them. Our VFW service officers outreach to locations in and close to larger cities has supported many aging minor minority veterans. One strong example of this is in our Harrisburg office where a strong percentage of those older veterans coming in for assistance are minorities. VFW service officers interact with the homeless veterans. If there is an aging veteran caught up in homelessness, we are there to help him or her improve their standard of life. In many wooded areas, rural sections of Pennsylvania, you will find VFW service officers combing through the small towns, farming areas, and town gatherings to locate aging veterans. We ask them if they need assistance or if they know of existing programs like death benefits, aid, attendance, and other benefits frequently used by our older citizens. We visit veterans post buildings in many small towns because there are still many World War II veterans and Korea veterans who enjoy hanging out there with each other at the veterans clubs. We also visit nursing homes to educate res residents about veteran benefits. You will often find U.S. Se oh, I'm sorry. You will also find often find us at senior expos and at information fairs sponsored by the state lawmakers to promote our benefits assistance program to senior citizens. VFW service officers frequently meet and follow up with older veterans who become before our citizens never knew that they were eligible for any assistance. Yes, there are still many veterans across Pennsylvania who do not know about the VA and about state veteran programs and services. One case study, a World War II veteran came to speak with one of our outreach service officers. He was so hard of hearing that he could not communicate well with a service officer. His son reported that his aging father had become a hermit 
virtually staying at home because he could not communicate with others. Our service officer represented a veteran before a VA Board of Appeals, which resulted in the older veteran receiving 100% disability compensation. While many World War II veterans, Korean veterans have passed away, there are still thousands of these and other veterans still living in the Commonwealth. Also, we must consider the generation of veterans following World War II in Korea. The Vietnam War veterans are mostly at least 65 years or old, old and many who have, yeah, and many beyond the 70 year old. Due to causing environment conditions that many of these Vietnam veterans served in, one of which was created by Agent Orange use, many of them are aging faster than the general public. Some are passing away well short of the ages reached by World War II veterans and Korean veterans. Therefore, it will not be a stench to consider that many Vietnam War veterans as, as, personal living in their final, as personally living in their final decade. The Pennsylvania Veterans of Foreign Wars will continue to outreach to aging veterans, including those who are aging far faster than their predecessors. Also, they know about and can apply for state benefits, services, and benefits. We will continue our successful outreach methods and stay flexible to expand how we meet and assist these ver valued citizens. To everyone here today, thank you for the opportunity and for your service to our state, and thank you for the Act 66 program support and its continued increasing level of funding. Thank you. Bruce? Thank you. Then we'll go to questions. Okay. Uh, good morning. My name is Bruce Foster. I manage the American Legion's uh, Veteran Outreach Program for Pennsylvania Veterans. And on behalf of our State Commander, James Volrath, uh, I'd like to thank you for allowing me the opportunity uh, to discuss Pennsylvania Veterans this morning. I'll keep my comments pretty brief. Um, my colleague here from the Veterans of Foreign Wars may have forgot to mention that other organizations such as the American Legion, the Disabled American Veterans, the American Veterans, the Vietnam Veterans of America, and the Military Order of Purple Heart all do veteran outreach across this great state to the best of their abilities and their budgets. You know, I find it fascinating um, the way the, the uh, VA c calculates our veteran population. But um, what it tells us in their uh, latest report is that you know, just over a month from now, on September 30th, 2018, our veteran population in Pennsylvania will drop under 800,000 for the first time in over a century. <clears throat> To some, this might seem like a good thing. Um, as we have less veterans to care for, um, it should cost less, right? Um, however, when I add that over 55% of those 800,000 Pennsylvania veterans are age 65 or older, it might, say, it might open some eyes that we have some urgency in expanding outreach programs that change lives every single day. If you knew that we had a 122,327 veterans who are between the ages of 70 and 74, <clears throat> would, would that convince you that it's time that we take action now? Or that we have another uh, 74,122 that are between the ages of 75 and 79? Would that be the decider in your mind or that other, or would it take the 146,000 Pennsylvania veterans who are over the age of 80 to see how urgent our problem really is? Folks, our, our veterans need <clears throat> long-term health care solutions, um, home health care, and assisted living. The partnership between the state and the VSO grant program is a proven success story. Data provided by the VA, not, not coming from us, but uh, proves that. Act 66 does pay for itself many times over in not only revenue, which we talk about a lot, but the savings it generates with medical savings through <clears throat> Medicare and Medicaid 
it took us four budget years to increase Act 66 funding. And um, that was after we maintained it stable for eight years. <clears throat> I want you to consider a simple situation, one that we will all be faced with one day, veterans or non-veterans. And that is that as we age, our need to preserve the resources that we put away while we were working <coughs> uh, increased greatly. Veterans and their families face this same situation every day. That families struggle with finding resources to care for their parents, their grandparents, and great-grandparents. Veterans are very proud individuals. <clears throat> uh, you often hear them say that, that they're not looking for a handout, or it should go to somebody who deserves it more, or we don't take charity. But I can tell you from experience, when a few dollars more means the difference between putting a loved one in a private assisted living facility instead of a Medicaid home, nursing home, just by using the benefits they earned by serving their country, now that's a wonderful day. VA pension benefits can help veterans and their spouses live, live higher, live in higher, more independent levels of care for, much, for a much longer period of time. <clears throat> you should understand that the VA is the second largest bureaucratic federal agency. It runs by rules, regulations, and laws. Title 38 of the United States Code is the, is, outlines the benefits uh, and becomes our lesson book as, as service officers. Internally, the VA uses their M21 and M21 procedure manual to keep its decisions consistent. I tell you this story because it's the same rules, regulations, and laws that make many veterans and their families eligible for benefits. Now, the VA does not go out of its way to advertise that they have money and benefits to give away. Using a trained accredited representative um, will ensure success and receipt of the maximum benefits available. The VSO grant program has, has literally helped thousands of Pennsylvania veterans receive benefits when they need them the most. Every time we enroll a veteran in the VA health care system, your state budget should go cha ching. That's another veteran that we don't have to save Medicaid dollars for. <clears throat> Everyone who we attain service connection for um, is just another one that you won't have to fund long-term health care for. We support legislation that will increase funding for Act 66 in the most expedient way. We have long supported the idea of, the, of using the lottery system as a bill payer for Act 66. We need to know more about the VGT bill um, uh, before we're ready to commit to it, but the Pennsylvania War Veterans Council uh, will study that idea and, and uh, hopefully support it when they get back together here in September. In closing, I just want to—I just want you to consider one more situation. It's ours. Imagine how many Vietnam veterans there are in Pennsylvania, or the widows. I'm sorry, widows of Vietnam veterans there are in Pennsylvania, whose husbands passed away years ago from what is now considered a presumptive condition related to Agent Orange exposure. Conditions such as respiratory cancers, leukemia, systemic heart disease, Parkinson's, and the and widows um, don't even know that they are eligible for both compensation and health care uh, from the VA, and they're totally unaware of it. I want to thank you for this opportunity to speak this morning and talk about uh, uh, a little bit about our programs and that's my presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We're going to get some questions for you. Okay, cool.
Thank you, Steve. Uh, John, uh, Bruce, thank you very much for your testimony to the committee here today. Uh, John, you mentioned the Veterans of Foreign Wars Veterans Service Officer, and, and Bruce, you added the American Legion, the AMVETS, the uh, uh, Military Order, the Purple Heart, uh, Vietnam right. Veterans. They all have, if each of those associations has a VSO, uh, a service officer, and each of the counties, I believe, has a, a service officer. How do they coordinate? Uh, can you explain the relationship between uh, the, the county level VSOs, which I'm familiar with? And, you know, when I have veterans come into my office, sure. the first call I make is to Lawrence Davidson saying, you know, what can you do to help this fellow? Sure. And uh, and they're very. And by the way, Lawrence, I'll shout out for him. You know, I, I say, look, I got a guy who's 85 years old here. I'm not sending him down to Westchester to go trying to figure out the government services building down there. It's like sending him to the the Pentagon, uh, right. you know, you come up to my office, and he's very willing to do that and meet in my office with these veterans, uh, and he's helped them significantly. One guy went from like a $300 a month pension to $1,300 a month just by meeting with uh, Lawrence happens one time. Hap happens every day, sir. Yeah, and, and, and so thank you for the, the work that your groups do. But tell us, if you will, just how they interplay with each other so that uh, we can understand okay. it better. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, each county in Pennsylvania, all 67 are mandated by the county code to have a county director of veterans affairs. And, um, uh, you know, it, it, that person's responsibilities are many, um, but taking care of uh, benefits is one of those responsibilities. But I can tell you that, that um, if I can tell you a quick story, I was driving one day through Chambersburg. And it seemed like I was never going to get out of town. I, I just kept going and going and going and going. And I said to my, I just come from the county director's office. And I said to myself, how can a how, how can a county director take care of the veterans in his capital city? I, I mean, he's got so many to take care of there. How does he do um, the, the veterans outside of his capital city? And, um, and but we we work with many of the county directors of Veterans Affairs, uh, the York County Director of Veterans Affairs. We work exclusively with uh, Jefferson County, uh, Clearfield County. Um, uh, we work uh, hand in hand with those vet or those uh, agencies. We are willing to work with anybody uh, to help veterans. And um, uh, some county directors see us as a threat to their job, I think. Um, um, but it's, you know, all, all we all want to do is help veterans, that's all. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, you know, I don't know if you want to add something, John. Can I, I just ask a question that we, before we leave okay. that? Veterans, the, the county veterans uh, offices right. exist. But, you know, I think they also have what's called a VSO, a veteran service officer. And I, have, as I understand it, these people are highly trained and, and skilled in knowing exactly the programs that the federal government and the state government offer to our veterans. So the county directors are one group of people, but right. the VSO officers are the ones I think you have to hone in on because they're the, one, they're the ones that are certified officers who receive the training, know well, where to point the, people in the best direction. The the state of Pennsylvania manages its own is what they manages its own power of attorney, um, uh, and um, they provide training and accreditation to the county directors. And I'll let General Weller and his team talk about that. Um, but um, uh, you know, they, they accredit um, the county directors of Veterans Affairs. We do the same thing through our veteran service organizations. We all have an accreditation program. We all have a uh, continuing education program. Um, you know, we're continually taking uh, um, uh, web-based training um, to improve our skills or, or uh, a weakness in an area, area maybe. But, but I would say that uh, we're subject matter experts on federal benefits and um, 
uh, were just in addition to the County Directors of Veterans Affairs. If you look at it in, in a total, uh, that is our veteran support system in Pennsylvania. Our okay. County Directors of Veterans Affairs and our, our VSO partners um, uh, through the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. And of course they're doing outreach all the time um, uh, with their outreach vans to try to get the word out. There are. Okay. Well, Bruce, thank you. I think John okay. wants to add, okay. jump in here. I just want a couple things. Uh, well, ba basically, in the, on the VFW side of it, we, uh, in fact, uh, every August, we have 40 hours worth of training that we send to all of our new uh, service officers. When I say new service officers, that's within five years of service. Uh, after five years, we have an advanced training, which we give them another 40 hours worth of training, uh, which is uh, held in the November time frame. And then it's getting that, uh, pro that that busy that we also have a training now also in the uh, the uh, January time frame. So we try and give them at least 40 hours of training now. Also under the state benefits, I have, I have had the uh, Department of Military and Veterans Affairs come to all of our officers and train uh, everybody on state benefits so they're, they're fluent with them also. Okay, well thank you for your testimony, both of you. I just wanted to make sure we weren't duplicating services as opposed to coordinating services. And it sounds like the coordination's happening. Sir, the, I, I can say that, that, that we don't have enough service officers in Pennsylvania with our county directors, with the VSO uh, program, we should triple it. Um, okay. <laughs> that's all I can say. You're saying the need's there. Yeah, yeah the, need, the need's there, and duplication's not there. The thing is that when you talk competition, yes, there is competition out there uh, with, the, with the county directors and, and even other service organizations sometimes. We try and work well with each other, but we actually have some county directors who won't let us in because we're going in our territory, and then they fight. So we do have that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, well thank you very much for your testimony, both of you. you bet. Great, um, Chairman Sonata. Uh, thank you, Chairman Ennessy. I just want to thank you. Um, I have the uh, officer come into my office once a month. They're doing a great job. Uh, it's Appreciate a good that. need. It's a good need in the community, and we get a lot of positive feedback. Uh, they do provide very valuable information. So I just wanted to pass that on. Those services are great for our veterans and our community, uh, and that's something I think is a very valuable program. So thank you uh, for your efforts. The chair. Oh, go ahead. The, go ahead the, uh, I was just going to say that uh, we've been in your office for a long time, and, and uh, that's handled by my area office. And, and um, but you know we we ask each one of our our partners our legislative partners this year to sign a memorandum of understanding you know what we're going to provide what what we expect them to provide um, but you know basically they provide the space for us they provide the advertisement uh, let your constituents know that 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 we're coming all of our veteran service officers have access to to the VA records and um, they're limited by power of attorney but but we can set up in any place chairman Samuelson thank you you talked to Talk about the services available all over Pennsylvania. Right. How many uh, veteran service officers do you have in the VFW, and how many do you have in the American Legion? Okay, I have uh, 29 in the VFW, American Legion. I have 19. And they're located all different parts of Pennsylvania. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, same here. I have I have uh, offices in Erie, Butler, Altoona, uh, Lock Haven, Harrisburg, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Wilkes-Barre. And then we have outreach that runs out through those, those areas, and also we're in legislators' offices and, and also clinics and everything else throughout the state. And has that number been stable the last couple of years, or have you been adding veteran service well, officers? I, what I did, I added uh, after Act 66 took place, the, the purpose of the program is outreach. So with that, with that purpose, I tried to hire as many service officers in the state of Pennsylvania so we could get into the rural areas and make sure that uh, the veterans are taken care of. We, we, between us, <laughs> um, you know, we're we're the largest um, uh, two organizations that uh, that get a piece of pie, uh, the Act 66 budget. But um, uh, between us, we have kind of a different philosophy of of who we hire, and 
um, you know, we pay all of our employees benefits, health care, uh, retirement, uh, all that, uh, um, where uh, some of the other organizations don't. And so it keeps us at a limited number of, of people that we can add. Um, um, so, you know, uh, John's philosophy is to hire people that he doesn't have to need, provide benefits to, so um, uh, he can stretch his dollars farther than I can. Yeah. Well, one, one thing, my philosophy is to hire uh, veterans uh, that are retired or on disability. Uh, I try to do that, but the problem, sometimes the problem with that is if they do have post-traumatic stress and stuff like that, if they sit there and listen to the stories of the veterans coming in, it does create more post-traumatic stress for them. Okay. Representative Dush. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Bruce, you brought up Jefferson County, and I, I, I've, I'm blessed. Herb Bowler's the county commissioner who's actually in charge of that, works very well with Krupa Steel or VSO. Um, and your people come down, I've got the one from Erie office comes to my Brookville office and then right. south of 80 we've got uh, the guy from Pittsburgh comes up to my Punxsy office. Right. My question is, you mentioned about uh, some of the conflicts that happen and Herb uh, has questions from time to time on where the lanes mm -hmm. are crossed and where, you know, who's who's got what. Is there any way of uh, possibly getting a written outline of where that, where those lanes are because we, our people want to work together, and sure. uh, we don't have the competition and the headbutting, uh, fortunately. But we do, we would like to uh, see a little bit, so well, that we aren't bouncing back and forth between offices. The. Um, uh, from the from our perspective, and I'm sure John will agree with this, that, that from our perspective, we just want to help veterans, okay, <laughs> wherever they are. And um, um, you know, sometimes the county directors, like I say, and I understand it because I I used to work for the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. I used to manage the county directors at some point and and uh, I understand you know that that they may see competition or whatever we don't have competition well you know what I'm saying a, a veteran is a veteran we want to help that veteran no matter where that veteran is and, and um, um, so you know if if I think I'd have to talk to uh, Rick and, and uh, if we were going to come up with some kind of a written uh, thing, but uh, um, you know, uh, the county directors of Veterans Affairs belong to the Pennsylvania War Veterans Council, they belong to the State Veterans Commission, um, in fact the chairman of the current chairman of the State Veterans Commission is um, a county director of Veterans Affairs, um, you know, they hold all the cards, <laughs> you know. So, um, uh, but we're willing to work with anybody. And, and like I say, the um, the the county directors that we have a direct correlation relationship with uh, are um, uh, are happy, you know. So, um, Jefferson is is a longtime American Legion county. Yes. They've uh, been uh, working with us for many years, so. Thank you. Okay, Representative Delizio. Well, I've learned so much this morning. Good. Amazing. Uh, gentlemen, have you, two questions. Is there ever an intersection with a prize? So a prize comes out of the Department of Aging, provides uh, highly trained volunteers to help older citizens understand particularly insurance benefits. And I'm wondering if the apprise folks are at all familiar with at least making referrals or particularly asking those spouses. You've indicated that there's lots of citizens out there who may not even know they're benefit eligible. Right. And that question may be better directed to the secretary eventually, but if you say a p what's a prize, then I'll know. And, and that may be an intersection to help your world move mm -hmm. forward. Because a prize is, in, is, I think, in every 
County. I mean, we have an apprised person in our office monthly who has a, a brisk kind of uh, business, if you will. The um, I can't say that I'm familiar with that. Okay. Um, but but I too have Applies? learned that many things okay. today. Well, <laughs> then this might be a, a yeah. one one really good concrete definitive outcome that could happen immediately from sure. this se Secretary Osborne, um, because a prize is I can see some synergy here without anybody um, stepping or stepping out of a lane. Yeah. And then your comment, uh, Mr. Foster, that had uh -oh. to do with with lottery funds. Is but, that a pitch for lottery funds or do you already receive well, lottery support? It, um, um, uh, Representative Barrar um, sponsored a, a, a bill to to use lot, lottery funds for um, uh, to fund uh, as a bill payer for Act 66. Um, and you know we have as a uh, the Pennsylvania War Veterans Council which is made up of all the veteran service organizations have supported that concept for a long time and um, you know we have we have moved it's it's kind of like the military we've kind of moved forward and stepped back and moved forward and, and stepped back but uh, um, you know the, my point of my whole presentation is that that, that we need to, if we're going to help the veterans in Pennsylvania, we need to help them now. We can't wait. We I, we, we got to find the funding to 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 um, take care of of these veterans. And in turn, I'm telling you, if you, if we studied. If we studied um, um, the impact that that veteran benefits have in saving state funds, um, uh, you would see that it would pay for itself immediately. Th thank you. Okay. Yeah, Represent Delicio. Um, my my legislation, what it does, it would create a special veterans lottery ticket that would be available on certain um, national holidays that would help to fund um, Act 66 and also um, the adult daycare program where the, that money then would be targeted. There would only be, I think our, our legislation creates five five days a year. Is it Would it be five days? Is that what it yeah, reads? Roughly. I know we've changed it in the past. Yeah, still, yeah. And then the other thing I have is a VGT bill that would go that would allow for private clubs um, the VFW clubs then to put VGTs in and then that uh, money would then be available um, it would go into the, the fire um, fire department there into their private clubs and also the the VFW private clubs that again that revenue would be used for um, additional upkeep for their facilities it would go to act 66 and also for other programs other veteran programs depending on of course how much um, how much money it could make okay but the expansion of act 66 is very important um, to, to these gentlemen okay representative white um, earlier we were discussing um, you know the the overlap of the areas that you are in and the county persons that are taking care of our veterans and the gentleman who works in my office he had mentioned at one point or another I believe that there's sort of like this competition and the reason for it is because it's based on volume like the number of veterans that are served is that and is there any truth to that or um, like <laughs> why, why is there competition in other words the, the, like why is there that that you know yeah that it, it, the, there is no, no, no such thing as competition I agree yeah yeah <laughs> um, uh, you know I mean if if John and I compete for a piece of the act 66 puzzle I mean the funding okay if, if you looked at it in a pie situation you know um, um, he wants a portion of the pie we want a portion of the pie just to, to do what we do but but um, uh, there's no competition between us um, uh, you know the uh, we're not trying to outdo each other or or anything like that uh, um, yeah, uh, yep. we, we just we just try and uh, make sure everybody serves in the state of Pennsylvania. 
That, that's what we're here for. We're, we're here to make sure that there, there is competition out there. Okay, again, territorial and stuff like that. Like I said before, in some of the, the counties. Right. That that's what I was getting at. Okay. Why is there that? Because you know, I think there are, there are relationship there. They, what, what's taking think, place that maybe think, we can help to rectify? I, I, th I think the count. Okay, I, I don't know, but I think some of the counties that I've been watching that have that direct competition uh, with our service officers. It's I think they're in fear of their job. I think they're in fear of what they're doing that, that, that we're taking over their their area. Which that which, you're doing uh, it better. Yeah, you, you, you have to understand okay. we have we have very good people out there and they're excellent at what they do. And they do pull the pull the veterans in. So, and I think that's some of the stuff. Is is it because the the right now the the, the pot of money for Act 66 is 2.8 million? Right. Do the county directors get part of that? Two point nothing. No, no, no. Do they, any of their employees? So they get nothing out of the, the two point eight no. eight million no. that no. is allotted by the state no. budget. That okay. that that two point eight million dollars is 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 our um, uh, agreement between us. The, okay. The I thought maybe that's why there was some maybe hostility or pushback no. from, no. I, from I the mean, county I can, offices. I, if you, I can explain it probably this way. Okay, and that is that that every county has a county budget. And um, uh, you have commissioners that that manage the county budget, and then many times a commissioner will say, "Oh, you know, maybe I don't need a full-time county director. I'm required by the county code to have one, but maybe I don't need a full-time director. Maybe I could just hire a part-time director right. because the VFW is coming to my town on this day, and the American Legion is coming on this day, and uh, you know." Uh, we have no control over that, but I think that's where the animosity starts. That that uh, people, um, uh, county directors, might see their their. Uh, if the more outreach we do in their county, the more the commissioners might say, maybe we will save some dollars here. Okay. And Very quick. Okay. Are you jumping in? Yeah. Okay. If I can. Yeah. Just to comment further on the ticket, so you understand, the lottery uh, started 45, 46 years right. ago in Pennsylvania on the promise that its funds would be dedicated to the needs of senior citizens, not right. not all veterans, right. uh, but to senior citizens. New right. Jersey dedicates its to education uh, uses. Pennsylvania, though, was was uh, created the lottery with the promise to serve senior citizens. What we've right. been working out are the details in terms of how to take the lottery, a veterans lottery ticket that Steve's uh, promoting mm -hmm. uh, and make sure that, that the uh, programs that the that are funded by that kind of uh you know the purchase of those tickets right. uh, are de dedicated to seen to veterans who are 60 and over to meet the definition and to live within the parameters of our statute that created the lottery in Pennsylvania in the first place. Uh, so we, we're, that's that's the tug of war that's been going on. It's not anything that, you know, and no animosity with right. to be directed toward veterans. It's just to make sure that we live within the parameters of existing law. No, we're, we understand that. And, okay. And um, you know if. If let's say that, that let's say that that the lottery system um, uh, let's say we did use the lottery system for Act 66 funding, uh, it would be up to us to write a program um, of how to use um, those additional dollars to strictly support those. 55% of our 800,000 veterans uh, that are over the age of 65, right. or age of 60, 60 in Pennsylvania. Yeah, 60 in Pennsylvania. So, okay. so we're on the same track. Oh yeah, you know, yeah. And we, and we are we, making progress. Yeah, and so. and if there's anything that we can contribute to that. As far as um, the planning, uh, we would be more than happy to do that. Okay, thank you. you bet. There's certainly no shortage of um, veterans over the age of 60 that no. we can that we can help. That's so. exactly right. Next question, Representative Fritz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There has been a Ryan. very clear theme today, and that is one of partnerships, and we see it with the VA, we see it with our state, okay. as well at the county level through our AAAs and our and our veteran directors, and as well the American Legion and the VFW. So I want to I want to speak to that a little bit, uh, uh, and here's here's the theme. I do host a service officer in my in both of my legislative offices, and oftentimes I will interact with that veteran on his way out. 
And this will be his, his response. I never knew. And we speak to that, uh, uh, one of our uh, testifiers presented that half of our veterans are unaware of some of the benefits that they are entitled to. So in looking at the partnerships, I'm wondering if there's, and this is an idea, if there's a, an additional partner that perhaps we're overlooking here, and that would be the AARP. They are a nonprofit organization, and they very much have a theme of eradicating poverty. So I think that perhaps they could provide a forum, and they have the outreach uh, ability to, uh, to perhaps disseminate some of this information. And uh, again, that follows on some of our, our, uh, our partnership themes, and especially the public-private. So just wanted to bring that idea forward. Thank you. Thank you. Can okay. I comment on it? Yes, just ahead. one comment, and that, and that is that, that the AARP, at least their, um, um, their representation at the Capitol, had led us to believe that they, um, uh, they would support the, the lottery bill. Um, uh, so, um, you know, I think that's important because uh, yeah, because of, of their outreach. So. Well, thank you for the suggestion, John. It was, that's really a, a very, uh, very good suggestion for us all to think about. One more. The last questioner is um, Representative Ryan. I'd like to add some clarity to the testimony you already heard today. This is a burning issue. These gentlemen represent an organization, and by full disclosure, I am a, a member, a life member of the one. Uh, and the VSOs perform an invaluable service, but I, I think we need to know why that is. And the questions were, we're trying to get at that today. If everyone is in charge, no one is in charge in reality. And the VSOs provide that link across the board. We have operational seams that are absolutely horrific for what a veteran has to do to jump through. Chairman, uh, you had a, a booklet that you had presented and, and uh, uh, Sean and Rick will tell you that I saw it and I said this is probably the best one I'd ever seen. I was a branch head at the Manpower and Reserve Affairs at Headquarters Marine Corps for three years prior to deploying to Afghanistan and Iraq. And, and I can assure you that that booklet will do more to help with the operational seams than you can imagine. If these gentlemen's VFO, VSOs were not doing what they were doing, you would be seeing complaints of unparalleled proportion in your district offices. We're getting them now. I have a, a fully disabled Silver Star, Silver Star uh, recipient in my district, a Purple Heart recipient, former county commissioner that was told that his injuries were not service related and connected after he had been getting disability payments for 35 years. VSO stepped in and helped. Uh, we have to realize that when you've got county, state, and local governments interacting with the federal government and there might be 50 different touch points that no one's going to know all the details. These organizations do. We need to do everything we possibly can to knock down these operational seams because until we do, veterans will not be served. Thank you. Um, and, and Bruce, you know how I feel about this program. Bruce and John, it, it, it's just, we have it in our office. We have the veteran service officer. He does a fantastic job. I get so many compliments um, on this program. And I'll tell you what, I, I think these are some of the best dollars that we spend in state government is this um, Act 66 program. So everything we can do to, um, to help you, it, you know, we're hoping that we can get you additional funding so we can continue to expand this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen, and thank you for taking time out of your schedule sure. to you. be with thank us you. today. Thank you very much. Our final panelist is Mr. Bob Singalis. Oh, wow. Did I say it right? Pretty good. Okay, cool. Good. I'm looking at it, and I went, I had to figure it out. So, <laughs> territory manager for Veteran Home Care, New, New York, um, what is it, New York, Jersey? LCC, it's, okay, hey, <laughs> pleasure to have you. I'm trying to figure out what the last initials uh, no are, problem. NYJ. It's, sing it's Singalisi, first off, that, but you did Singalisi. very well, you did okay. very well, thank you. Yes, um, I just want to say before I even get started, uh, you know, thank you very much for inviting me here, for allowing me to present uh, Veterans Home Care to you, um, especially after the last two testimonies. Um, okay. 
you know, actually stole some of my thunder actually on some of them. Uh, our mission with Veterans Home Care, as we see, is to assist our veterans who protected our family and to stay in their homes and live with dignity. And listening to the last two testimonies, I really believe that veterans home care could be one of the solutions. So to uh, introduce myself, I am Bob Singalisi. I am the territory manager for the East Region of Veterans Home Care, LLC. Um, I am not a veteran. However, I am in awe of all of you who have served for our country. And I've been in many homes uh, since joining Veterans Home Care and listening to the veterans and helping our veterans and surviving spouses. So I'm also not a lawyer and I am also not a financial advisor. So um, I am a territory manager as I said. We are a private for-profit company that was started back in 2003 from our uh, founder, Bonnie Laderman. Bonnie's picture is in your packet there. This is Bonnie in our packet. And how Veterans Home Care got started was Bonnie's mother, unfortunately, had breast cancer. Bonnie's mother lived in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm sorry, Bonnie's mother lived in Florida, and uh, Bonnie lived in St. Louis, Missouri. So when Bonnie uh, found out that her mother had breast cancer, she became a caregiver for her mother. And once a month she would travel from St. Louis to Florida to help her ailing mother. Well this got to be obviously overwhelming for her and through research she found out that through the VA, the Veteran Affairs, they had a little known pension uh, known as aid in attendance. Now Bonnie's father was a Korean War veteran who had passed away. So when she learned about this pension, and uh, when she learned about this pension, she found out that her mother could be eligible for this pension to get the money, as we were just talking about with testimonies, to help her stay in the home and have that money pay for our health care benefits. Well, unfortunately, Bonnie's mother did pass away before the benefit was awarded to her. Hence, that's how Veterans Home Care came about. Her whole mission was to, her whole mission of starting Veterans Home Care was to educate the public. I've heard many times now from, from our veterans. I have spoke in front of over 200 veterans that don't know about this benefit. They don't know about any of the benefits that they are awarded with or that they are entitled to. So this is something that is strictly our mission is to help the veteran, educate the public, educate the healthcare industry of the benefits that our veterans are entitled to and their surviving spouse. With the, with the benefit of aid and attendance, we are the, this is the only benefit that we deal with, with the veteran. If, if it's something else related to veteran benefits, we then refer them to the county or the state VSO. So we're only dealing with the aid and attendance pension. So what we do is this, okay? This is a means-based benefit. They have to qualify for this benefit. Our job is to make sure that they do qualify for this benefit. And it goes by what we call the three M's. And, I, and I, everybody has in their packet a little card here. And part of the requirements for the aid and attendance benefit is that the, uh, the first one is military, that our veteran must have at least one day of active duty in a wartime period. They have to have 90 days of total active duty and they have to have an honorable discharge. Our second qualification is medical. So part of, the, part of the requirements for the veteran or the surviving spouse is that they need help. They need help with the basic ADLs, uh, activities of daily living, that they can't be driving, that they need help with preparing of meals, that they need help in hygiene. And this must be signed off by a medical doctor, not a VA medical doctor, their medical doctor has to sign off on this. The last, 
The last part is money. Money is always the one that will probably disqualify most of our veterans or surviving spouses is because if their income is too high or they have too many assets, they're not going to qualify for this benefit. If that's the case, then we refer them to their county VSO or we will refer them to some other health care provider that can help them. So now this is where Veterans Home Care comes in. We offer what we call the Exclusive Vet Assist Program. We determine if the veteran or surviving spouse qualifies for the aid and attendance pension. We then guide them to send us the necessary documents that they need for the VA application. And if you can see back on the card, it shows you all the documents that we need. Once we get all the documents, uh, for the application, we actually go to their home. We sit down, this is, this is the part that I am in awe of, because like, we go to their home, we sit down with them, we fill out the VA application with them, we make sure that they're qualified, everything is verified, and then we help them fill out the application, we then take it back, and then we upload it to the VA. Here's where we come in. Once we send the application to the VA, it can take anywhere from four to eight months for the VA to approve the application. While the application is pending, Veterans Home Care will offer them a zero interest loan while the application is pending so they could start their home care or adult daycare right away. Now we know we have a 98% accuracy when we send in the uh, application. And, and this is something that I didn't put into my remarks, if the VA denies the application of the uh, aid in attendance, and they deny it based on a medical reason, any money that we've laid out for the home care, they do not have to pay us back. And that's in black and white. However, if they get denied because the VA has found more money than what they have disclosed on the application, then of course they would have to pay us back. And a quick story about that is that I signed up, one of my first cases that I signed up was a 95 year old World War II veteran. He was living with his son and his daughter-in-law and we signed them up for the home care and we uploaded the application and about two weeks later, three weeks later, we get a call from the daughter-in-law. Now, I don't know if anybody here has heard the term strong box, but a strong box is more or less where you would put important papers or, uh, or money. And this veteran, we found out, had uh, savings bonds that accumulated to a quarter of a million dollars. So he did not qualify anymore for the benefit. So, but I just thought, I mean, you know, listen, it happens. Sometimes the veteran or the surviving spouse, they have money that they don't tell their children about. So, and then it just comes out later on. But I just thought that was pretty cute. So once we send in the application, like I said, we offer them a zero interest loan so they could get started right away with the home care. They don't have to wait for the VA's money. And then once the VA does award them the money, the money is retroactive from the time that we met with them. And that money will pay back my company's money, the money that we've laid out for the home care. As I said before, uh, uh, we are a for-profit company. How Veterans Home Care makes their money is that we have providers all throughout the country. We service 44 states. So we have providers, home care providers, adult daycare providers that we have agreements with. We ask them to take a discount on their private pay rate. We put in our small markup. We make the spread. We make anywhere between six to eight dollars an hour on every case that we sign up. And we make our money on volume. Now there's no out of cost pocket to the veteran or the surviving spouse. If you look at the card that I presented to you, you'll see the amounts of the aid and attendance that they could qualify for. We convert that into our hourly rates. If they go over, Let's use a surviving spouse, for example. You'll see a surviving spouse, uh, they get $1,176. 
that would uh, that would uh, turn into 42 hours a month of home care. If they go over that, they will pay out of pocket to the provider directly, whatever the provider will charge them. But for the first 42 hours, the VA benefit will pay for it. That's really about all I have on, on how we do what and what we do. Uh, my also, uh, my also uh, thing is to work with the county VSOs. Uh, I am, if you haven't known by now from my uh, Jersey accent, <laughs> I am from New Jersey and uh, we have representatives all over Pennsylvania as well. We have three full-time reps that cover Philadelphia, Pittsburgh and Harrisburg, so we have covered the state. We probably need more regions managers but you know just listening to uh, you gentlemen and this nice young lady uh, you know with their testimony and working with the VSOs uh, it's just something that I know I want to do more of I believe that veterans home care could be part of the solution to help our aging veterans and again I want to thank I want to thank you sir for giving me the opportunity to present my company to you and I'm obviously open for questions thank you anybody have questions for the testifier Steve chairman so when you do the um, zero interest loan when they get the retroactive check, that's to pay back the loan. That is correct. Okay. That is correct. Um, when they get a monthly benefit, um, are they getting the full monthly benefit, or you don't take a percentage? Of Always the monthly benefit. Okay. The full monthly benefit. Great. And the, the last uh, question is, when they get this uh, benefit from the VA, mm -hmm. um, they're able to use it for many different kinds of health care. Is, is that correct. correct? That is correct. You only um, are able to make money for your company when they sign up for certain providers. Do you try to get the people you help to sign up for your providers or do the, do the folks know that they're eligible to use that money for other before services? Before we go into the home, that's a fantastic question. Before we go into the home, before any of that starts, we educate them that they could do this on their own. That they could go to the VA, that they could qualify for the pension and do it on their own. And plus, they could use that money not just for home care or adult daycare, they could use it for other medical expenses. So they are fully aware of that. More times than not, they don't want to deal with that, so they bring us in. If they sign up with Veterans Home Care, that money, and they have to sign the agreement, that money is only to be used for either home care or adult daycare. But they are aware that they could use it for other purposes if they go on their own. Home care or adult take care at one of the facilities that you guys have a business relationship Correct. with. Correct. Correct. And if we don't, we will get them. I mean, we've never been turned away from a provider or adult day. How long is that um, commitment? If, you, if a veteran signs up and then decides two months later they want to keep getting the benefit, but use it for other healthcare related things. Uh, is your company, has, that, has your company locked them into a certain period of time with your provider? You know, it's uh, just yesterday, just yesterday, we are overhauling that. It was a one year agreement, but now it's going to be probably just for until we get paid back our loan. Just the initial startup period. That's it. And okay. then if they want to leave us, they can, and they could use the money for anything they need in the medical expenses. And they're aware that they can leave because of absolutely the initial conversation or some the ongoing? initial conversation. Everything happens before we go into the home. Okay. Like we don't enter the home until they have that understanding that they're using the funds with Veterans Home Care for a home care or adult daycare, mm -hmm. and that they can leave us to use it for other medical expenses. Okay. Uh, thanks for the information. Gillen. Representative Gillen. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Bob. Yeah, no just, a, just a diagnostic question. Do you encourage the veterans or their families to uh, share bank account information and draw down on that? Yeah, they, uh, no. Remember what I just said, I'm not a financial advisor. <laughs> so what happens is if we know that they're over on assets, we do have agreements with elder law attorneys and financial advisors and we will give them those phone numbers, that information. Okay. I, I don't have the expertise to do that. You don't have the expertise, I'm sorry, to what? To, to tell them how to spend down their money. 
Okay, so there's no sharing of account information with any of. Uh, oh, no, there is the at the time of application. Sure. Oh, okay, bank account information. Oh, yeah. Okay. They have the not, not just bank accounts and everything, uh, IRAs, stocks, bonds, all that. Any 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 liquid assets. Okay, and is that bank account uh, information shared uh, with other agencies or for profits that you work with? No. None, none whatsoever, just us. Okay. Uh, what is the net income uh, of the company overall, and how many states are you in? We are in 44 states. Okay. When you say the net income of them, you mean? Uh, the aggregate, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it really depends. And a, a, gui a great guide for me that I use is like when you look at the, the, the amount of the benefit that they apply for, if they're making anywhere from 1000 to $1,500 over that amount, they'll probably qualify. <laughs> Okay, so you don't have any information on the net income of the corporation? Of my company, you mean? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's a private company. All right, I'm sorry. I misunderstood your question. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I don't have that. I mean, it is a private company. Um, I'm not aware of, I mean, I, I, I can only guess what it is. Last year, I know our revenue was over $30 million, but I don't know what our net was. Okay, a final question. Sometimes there's controversy relative to veterans organizations and executive compensation. Do you have any information about executive compensation at your company? No, I do not. None okay. whatsoever. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any other questions for this? Oh, good. Chairman? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Bob, I'm, I'm a little confused. I thought that you said that once they exceed this benefit that's around, then the, the company will bill them directly for the additional home care services or adult daycare services. But then I, in, in answer to Steve's question, I get the impression that this benefit is like a check that comes to them and they pay for the, the first 42 hours of right. service out of that. Out of that the, is so, correct. So it's a, this is a direct check coming to the veteran or his spouse. That is correct. It goes directly into their, into their uh, account. Okay. So let's use a surviving spouse, for example. Again, if they, uh, it, will, it will come out to 42 hours a month of home care. So the okay. 1176 will go to them. Then they pay us. Okay, they pay us. Now let's say they need 60 hours a month of home care. The 18 hours is billed directly from the provider who's doing the home care to the veteran or the surviving spouse. So for the additional 18 hours, they're paying out of pocket to the provider directly. Okay, and for the first 42 hours, they're paying out of they're paying out of pocket. Well, they're using the by benefit. This, funded by this benefit. That is correct. Okay, and then what happens when the rates change, the rate per hourly rate? You know, no, they're locked in. They don't change their rates. I mean, whatever the rate is that they sign up, that's that's what they get. If anything, they're going to get more money from the from the VA if they increase the benefit. But whatever rate that they lock into, that's the rate is for forever. Forever. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. No problem. Thank you. <clears throat> Do you have any competitors uh, in this field? <laughs> if, if you ask Bonnie Laterman, the answer is no. But there are other companies out there that do what we do. However, we are the only company that has, and we call it boots on ground, we are the only company that goes to their home and sits down with them to go over the whole VA application and all the other documents that we need. And my other question would be, like, we have this problem with emergency uh, uh, with our EMSs. So if the check goes to the person that is correct. and they decide, hey, I'm, I'm going to use that money somewhere else, I'm not paying you this month, what, do you have any problems with that? What happens? Less than 1%, thank God. But yes, I mean, it does happen. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Representative Duff, that will be the last one. Just a quick question. I know you said you didn't have information on the executive salaries, but for example, someone like yourself who goes out and into the field, it's got to take a significant amount of money with travel expenses and wages and stuff like that. Uh, I'd be interested, what's the typical wage or salary for someone like yourself, and how in the world, do, if you're not 
taking i mean that eight dollars an hour doesn't seem like it's no it's it. It, and I, I i hear you um you know we've been been as uh, and been in, we've been in business since 2003 so we've helped over 14,000 we're climbing up to 15,000 veteran families a representative somebody like myself starts anywhere from 40 to 60 thousand dollars a year based on their expertise Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Um, there's no other questions. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank we you. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you for very, very much. Okay. We we have just a couple more minutes. I, d I didn't know there were a couple people who didn't get to ask questions of General Weller. Are they still interested? Um, was there anyone that didn't get their question answered? If not, um, Martina? Okay. General, do you want to? Can, why don't you just grab a microphone? You can just stand General. there. If yeah, that's fine. You can stand there. That's fine. Try to wrap this up real quick. Got it, boss. No problem. <laughs> I will. Uh, yeah. I, my quick question is really just to find out: Are there any efforts to encourage local hospitals and other type of medical facilities when they take in patients to actually ask those questions? Because it sounded like it was pretty successful from what you were doing, but then maybe um, you know, with your relations into the communities, can we build that up and get more information so that it can be put into our state database of veterans? I'm not, not quite sure how to answer that. Uh, I don't know if I actually have the answer. Uh, I know that eff there are efforts in that regard. Uh, actually, do you, do you know of anything formal? Or even like a formal training for hospitals right. to take advantage of from the state level so that they can make sure that an individual within their hospital or their medical facility, even just local doctor's offices, they can make sure that the people at the front desk, when they have individuals coming in, that they're asking the question, are you a veteran? Um, you know, and then we can make sure that that's being captured and we can you know, get to them more easily. You know, it, it's a it's an excellent suggestion and, and part of our opportunity with the survey that I mentioned that we did is where there's gaps and that is an identified gap in terms of that and this needs to happen at the local level so yeah. at the local level you know you know your community partners best at the local level including your hospitals and those hospital case managers and discharge planners who every day and pretty much in crisis mode because everybody waits till Friday at four physicians to discharge folks so there's no doctors here right yeah um, so th th I mean that that is an issue, but to your to your good suggestion that that is part of the survey process of a gap that we've identified. So working with our aging network providers, with our partners at the DMVA, with the hospital assist, uh, hospital association of Pennsylvania, and AARP was an excellent suggestion too that was made before. Uh, all of those collaborative efforts are occurring so that folks are aware of the registry and folks then know where to point a veteran to receive the services that they're not receiving, for which they say the the the, the good answer of I didn't know that was available. Um, most older Pennsylvania civilians don't know the array of services and supports that are available to them and we need to do a better job of educating them and also those who help them all of those points of entry great I, it's a great suggestion though thank you if I can add the the nursing association in Pennsylvania has a program it's called just ask in in I believe that's the title if I remember it. Um, um, but it really it, it's a triage question. Are you a veteran? Because because if a veteran comes in and, and they and they they ask, are you a veteran? And the person said, yes, I served in Vietnam. You know they can think of the Agent Orange presumptive conditions and um, uh, you know it's a great program and and it should be expanded. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Was there any uh, anybody else have a question? Okay, great. Um, just for closing remarks, I'll tell you what I heard several people say that they've learned a lot. I think the whole committee um, from both sides, from both different committees, um, have learned a lot today about the different programs out there. We thank you for your excellent testimony today and taking time to, to be here with us and um, truly appreciate your presence. Um, Chairman Hennessy, anything? 
Any of the other chairman? Yes. No, just let me say thank you very much for your attendance here today. I think we all learn a lot. And, and when we're learning something that we can pass on to our veterans to help them make their lives easier in return for the sacrifices they made for our country, uh, you know, I think we're doing a good job. It's a good day. Thank you. Chairman Sonata? Uh, I, too, just want to echo uh, Chairman Barrar, Chairman Hennessy's uh, comments. I thank you. Uh, I learned today. I think all of our members learned something. Uh, and when you put uh, both of these committees together, our, our interests are all the same, whether veterans or senior citizens. And uh, it was a pleasure hearing from each and every one of you. And we're going to continue to move forward on our efforts. So thank you for the testifiers. And thank the members for their questions and for coming here today. Commandant Col Coleman, um, we're yours now. So um, oh, this, this hearing, this hearing is adjourned. What's that? Oh, Steve, did you want to say something? I'm sorry, I thought you said you didn't have. Okay, I apologize. Okay, thank you.